<laughs> I forgot already. You see, okay, it's on. Okay, good to see everybody. Let's get uh, on with the show. So we've been learning the last few days. We started a campaign to be more mindful about how we speak to others and the effect of our words on others. So we're going to segue in a second here to um, the pamphlet goes on to give us five aces, five ideas how we can improve. We're going to get eventually to the more details of the halachas, but just a general attitude. First, he writes that we first have to learn how to train ourselves not to hurt others. By doing so, if we stop doing that, life becomes so more enjoyable. We make friends, we keep our existing friends, we get along better with our siblings, we become nicer people, the kind of people that others really like to be around. Until you try it, you cannot imagine the happiness one has when he overcomes himself, not to say something nasty to someone. Try it today, you'll want to sever that happiness again. This happiness will last for a long time. You will always be able to picture it in your mind. It is not all at all like the pleasure you get from a few seconds of saying a harsh word to someone which only lasts for a second. Okay, so he says we need to get into different behaviors. So the first eight that he starts off with is as follows. He says, one eight is to train ourselves that before we say something to others, we should think. How would I feel if I was told this? Before you say something out of your mouth, imagine if someone, think, how would I feel if someone said it to me? That's number one. And he says, many times that's not enough to really ask yourself, how would I feel about it since every person is different? You might think it doesn't affect me. But when I say it to somebody else, it might. So really the question has to be, will this, will saying this annoy the person that I'm speaking to? So that's what you have to ask yourself. And I just want to tell you something. I had, I had a story today. It's one of them, I, you know, I say this all the time and I realize I offended someone. Someone called me up from, from New York about information about the shidduch. And they told me, I said, where do you live? And he says, he lives in a borough park in Brooklyn. So I always say, it's interesting. I always say my condolences. <laughs> now, and we're all laughing, right? Now, I grew up in Brooklyn. I, I, I would say at one point in my life, it used to be the majority of my life, but it was really only a... Uh, at this point, it was only a third of my life. Not really, no, really half of my life, because I lived, I left and I came back and I lived until I was 30 years old with a gap of about uh, three, two, uh, two and a half years that I went to yeshiva. So the truth is I learned most of half of my life, a little bit less than half my life. So I feel like, you know, I'm in Brooklyn, I'm from Brooklyn, everyone hears me, knows that I come from Brooklyn, not from the Bronx, but from Brooklyn. And uh, I feel I could say it. But the woman that was talking to me, she lived in Borough Park. She was a very proud Borough Parker. And I, and I sensed that she was taken aback. And I really, I, I had just, I was learning this and I said, I realized, how would I feel, you know? And, and it's true, and people tell me, you know, you live in Baltimore and say, oh, Baltimore, you know, is, you know, are, are, you, are you brain dead? You know, that's usually the, uh, the uh, response when someone hears you live in Baltimore. And of course, it's hurtful, not because I'm such a, you know, uh, a, a citizen of, of Maryland and I'm so proud of it, uh, but, um, but anyway, but just say, you see, I, I make a joke out of it because the truth is I'm projecting my own frustrations of, you know, whatever it is I don't like about New York. But, but a person who lives there is very proud to live there and rightfully so. He lives at the people that I, they tell me which killer they belong to and all that. And, you know, it's a beautiful community that they belong to within Borough Park. And uh, so I just realized you, you could say something and you don't ask, what would I mind if someone told it to me? First of all, probably I would be offended if someone insulted me and I live in Baltimore. But, and then I say it's on, even you say it's a joke, but if someone took an offense to it, so I really, it changed. I, it's, it's something that I often say, so I have to be careful. So I just, and uh, you have to ask yourself before you say something, not only how would I feel, that certainly might help, and say, will this annoy the person? Are they proud about what you're about to say and you're gonna say something, even in a joke, it was a, clearly a joke, I didn't, I didn't mean it, although, there was, every joke has a certain level of something. Okay, so that's my confessional for today. And then he says, he says, uh, this is the foundation of hurting someone, to really think uh, before you speak, how will I, uh, what, what I want it to be said to me, and certainly will this annoy the person? And he gives some examples here. We have, so if there are children here, this is written for a camp setting. So I give a few examples and we can share it. I'm not sure there's some kids here. And we're all kids at any rate, but we can all, uh, we can all um, apply it to our own life. So he gives examples. He says, you are at the ropes course or monkey bars, and your friend is afraid to go on. 
telling him, oh, you're such a scaredy cat, is I know Dvarim. Think, would I want to be made fun of for something that I'm afraid to do? And then he says a better one, and this also I'm guilty of. He says, you are eating in the dining room, and you see your friend eating something that you would never eat, like ketchup and cereal and milk, or chocolate syrup and applesauce. Telling him, ugh, that's disgusting. How can you eat that? Is I know Dvarim. Avoid telling people how you hate a certain food, how it is disgusting, etc. since the people whom you are talking to may eat it all the time and may lose their appetite because of your comment. Think, would I want to lose my appetite for something which I enjoy eating? Usually, I happen to be, and this happens sometimes in certain circumstances where I'm in, I happen to love herring. I don't usually eat it, but sometimes my son comes over, so we, we, we make a little herring party. Because, you know, as you get a little older, the, the, um, the cholesterol may life take a little bit to it. But the high salt content, you gotta be careful. So, you know, it's very salty. But occasionally I eat it. And there, there's some people who really abhor it. That, you know, that we wrap it up in 10 bags when they throw it out because the smell of herring. And when they make those comments, I usually take three portions more. So I'm not sure if you, uh, you're over on Aynas Dvarim when you do it in reverse and you respond by, you know, making it even more obvious how the smell of the herring is offensive. But at any rate, certainly this is something that we can all relate to in so many circumstances. Then he says another Aitza. And this is amazing. Think about it. We don't think about it. He says such a pushed idea. He says another aid to help prevent hurting people, someone else's feelings, is to help us stop hurting hurtful words to another is by realizing how great every yid is and that he is at Selma Likim. We forget every human that we see, every human, even uh, mo- most Rishayim learn that it applies to every, every uh, human being. But certainly to an every, every yid, every person is at Selma Likim. In Pasha Kedosh, he brings a, a beautiful verse from Chaim Shalavit, so I heard, I heard this from him also. I heard the whole series of Shurim, of Shmuzin that are printed in his name. Those are the years I was there. And the Pasha says, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy, God tells us. So the, then the, the, the Medrash, the, the Chazal say, God says, Kedoshim to you, you should be holy. So he said, how holy do we have to be? So the, the, the Gemara says, you think that God is telling us we have to be as holy as him. So the Gemara says, no, then God says, don't worry. I'm on a different level of Kedusha than you. But, but it's incredible to think that there's a Havamin in the Gemara, there's a Havamin in the Gemara that maybe our Kedusha ascends to the height of, of our Kedush Baruch Hu. So uh, and maybe it ascends that high. Maybe, maybe it is that high. And it's a, an incredible thought. And Rechaim Shalevitz explains that if we would really know and understand the godless of every human being, we, would commit, we, could, we could possibly make a mistake. Because you really understood how great everyone is in a certain way, then we could understand the having of, you know, Yahu Kamayin, maybe we'd be like God. And he said, this you say, that the Yid is a Telem is actually, is actually the basis for some halachas. We learned it in Shabbos, is it in, in, in the Dafyami? that um, you wash your face, that one of the obligations to wash your face in the morning, is not stop, you know, wake up and wash your face uh, cleanliness. It's a tell Mali Kim, you're supposed to take care of it. You wake up, you look in your face, it's a tell Mali Kim. I once, just to give you something, I once taught this, I once went to a camp, Camp Norim, I was invited for Shabbos to, to speak, and I, I shared with them something I saw many years ago, and it says, maybe you heard it from me, it says, you know, if you look, and this will change the way you look at every human being, because once I point this out to you, you're going to see that Selma Likim every time. You know, the, the gematria of Yud Kevavke, which is, means God, how you have a year, is 26. It says, if you look at a person's face, so the two eyes look like two Yuds. It's like a little Yud. Imagine the eyes. Next time you look at someone, look at his eyes. It's like the shape of a Yud. And if you look at the nose, especially if you have a Jewish nose like me, it's, uh, you know, everyone has it. But if you look at it straight there, it's like a Vav. 10 plus 10 and 6 is 26. So Hashem imprinted the Yud Kevavke, 20, Six, the vav is the nose, and actually the vav is where the nostrils is where Hashem infused his spirit in us. The, 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 the soul, our soul, Hashem infused us with his it says, the one who blows into you blows from his own, his own essence. So that's where the Telma the Kim comes from our nose, and it's right there, the two, the little yuds, like in the city, you two do that, it represent the name of Hashem, but we have the whole name. The Yud Kevav, so every time you look at someone, you're going to see in their face the Yud Kevavke. So, and he says, when, and he writes, he says, beautiful, he says, for example, one should, we wash our hands and face every day because of the Kvayt Hashem, because 
we have to clean off. Hashem is on our face. We have to show our respect and our kindness. That, that's a halacha. And he said, when someone is Mitzayar another Yid, it's as if you're Mitzayar Hashem. You have to think that. When you say something, you, your God is standing right there. This can be seen in a few places in Shas. The Gemara says that uh, if you slap someone, the Gemara says, Kilu soita lo it's like you slap God in the face. And, um, and as we said, you know, um, yeah. And hurting someone with words is a greater than a slap, like we said the other day. Vilna also says it. And when you say it, you're really saying harmful words and you're assaulting Hashem. And he said, the mission also says a Yid, um, it, when he's in pain from punishment, which was he's receiving for whatever I've already did, the Shechina says, my head, my arm. Hashem says, Kalani Mirashi, I feel the pain in my head and my arm. God uses that description of the Navi because he really is, in a sense, he's here with us. He feels the suffering that we're going through. And that's how the Gemara depicts it. And that's how Hashem feels the pain, even of a Russia. He surely feels the way about the pain of a tzaddik. I often quote it from Rabbi Feinstein, that God loves the worst Russia more than we love the greatest tzaddik. <laughs> that was his line. We should always remember, God loves the greatest Russia more than we love the greatest tzaddik. Just so you're going to get some, 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 some uh, perspective. And then he says, here are some ways which with which one can accustom himself to think about a yid as a telemedic him. When someone asks you to do something for him, like pass the ketchup and Kim, right? Jump to help him by thinking, I have an opportunity to, to, to help a telemedic him. You're trying to go into a building, someone else is trying to leave, and there's room only for one person at a time. Let him go first and think, I am now honoring the telemedic him by allowing him to go through the front door. If they're getting used to thinking that everything that we do for someone else is being done for a telemedic him, we will have a hard time saying hurtful words to anyone. And I always think, you know, before you do anything, and you get upset with someone, ask yourself, I used to tell when I was a Mechanech, I mean, I'm still Mechanech, but when I used to, you know, teach over the years, I would say, imagine if the Chavetz Chaim was here, and you're about to say something, what would he tell you to do? If you ask him, a Shail and Eitzah from a Gadol, what would he tell you at that moment when you're angry and you want to say it? And then imagine more than that. Imagine if Hashem says, you know, we could talk to him, say, God, you know, should I do it or not? It would certainly wake us up. Most often, our responses are just knee-jerk reactions. They're instincts, reflexes. It's not thought out. We just think for a second that, you know, we're affecting Hashem himself. And every human being is a Tamil like him. And sometimes it's hard. It's not hard. People are wicked. And people have bad attitudes. And people, you know, sometimes you do have to defend yourself. We'll talk about that another time. You're allowed to defend yourself. Someone assaulting you and say, well, it's a Tamil like him. You know, yeah, we're, we're not, you know, we're not Christians. Although we'll get to that, because Gemara says, you know, you, you take the insult and you don't respond. How do you deal with that? And he says, you have to think about people and think about human beings as Selim like him. And he brings a beautiful anecdote. The Alta Slabotka. The Alta Slabotka was the Rav Nassim Tzvifinkel, that was an elder's aid of the Nassim Tzvifinkel that, that we got to know when he came to Baltimore, or the Rashiva of the Miri Shiva. But uh, his, his elder Zayda was uh, Reb Nassim Sufinkel. And, and um, the elder Slobodka was a man who uh, his, his teachings was about um, godless Adam, how great a human being is. He elevated his Talmidim by inspiring them, not of the fear of what awaits them, but the, the elevation of who we are and what we stand for and what our, our responsibility is. And he wrote like this. They write a story like this. He said, the Alta Slabotka was once in a hospital for something, which happened to his throat, to his throat. And um, he had some problem with his throat. So the doctor asked him to stick his tongue out. He started to move his tongue, but he wasn't able to stick it out. This went on for 10 minutes. The doctor asked him to do so, and the, the Alta couldn't do it. The doctor wrote on the report, something is wrong with his tongue, obviously. The doctor told one of the family members what happened. The family asked the altar about it, and he replied, he says, I simply, I could not stick my tongue out at a tell like him. I couldn't even stick out my tongue to a doctor who needs to look at my throat, because I just couldn't bring myself. Imagine, even Hashem is standing there, and he's telling you, stick out your tongue. It would be hard, right? You're standing from the, 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 the Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the, 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 the Chavetz Chaim. It's hard to stick out your tongue. It was just an instinct, because when you treat every human being like a tell like him, then, then, then you have a reverence, and you watch not only um, you, 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 you uh, revere and respect people differently, but it has an effect on how, on how, um, how we control ourselves. 
and uh, hold ourselves from responding. And um, okay. And then he gives the last example he gives to the kids. We'll leave it with that. He says, teasing is a form of Nazvarim. For example, you're old enough to go into the street. Telling a younger friend whose parents don't let him go into the street, you can't catch me. No, 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 no. You can't go into the street. Is I know it's You're making him feel like a baby. Putting someone on a high shelf so that your younger brother can't reach him and tell him you can't get it is a Nazvarim. Think, my friend, my brother is a Tzemalikim. How can I make him feel bad? I'm going to control myself and not say it. So for those kids among us, and all of us who are still kids, we have to realize, and like I say all the time, most often the things we say, the most caustic words, are usually the ones who are closest to us, who should be close to us because we have some familiarity, and we're more offended when those who are close to us uh, you know, act in a way that hurt us. So therefore, the response is, is sometimes equal to them. So we have to remember, everybody, even brothers and sisters, are uh, Selma Likin, believe it or not. <laughs> At any rate, that's, that's my lesson for today.